Well, thank you. Good to see all of you again tonight. It's always good to be back out here with you. Did all of you get one of these papers that we're going to be? Does anybody need a pen or a pencil? And are there some available? I should have asked that in advance. I'm not a very good planner in that regard. Um, Caleb, I'll just tell y'all when it's time to advance, so don't sweat over the advancing part of it. And y'all always tell those guys thank you because that's a thankless job working in the sound booth because nobody ever thinks to say thank you to them. So let's give Caleb a hand right now. Uh, Let me kind of share my journey that brought me to this place tonight to share with you. Uh, I pastored 34 years before becoming a director of missions and... uh, you know, a lot of people think that directors of missions don't know anything, so they they don't have anything to say. You know, D-O-M is my abbreviation. Some people think that's dirty old man. Some people think it's dumb old man. And I, I'll leave it up to you what you decide about that. But one of the things I've learned is every step you make in life, God uses that to through you to help other people, whether it's teaching school or pastoring or director of missions. And so pastoring for that many years in six different churches, uh, I learned a lot of lessons, and many of them were my own fault through, and got bumps on the head from it. But there, there's a couple of things that's ha- had a profound impact to bring me to where I want to share the passion I will, uh, with tonight with you. Uh, one is I was uh, raised up in northern Sabine Parish, a little place called Converse. And when I was saved at the age of 11, uh, and I'm not here to put down any church or any group, but my church, I remember them telling me, you're saved and prepared to go to heaven. And y'all have a similar experience. You're saved and you're prepared to go to heaven. Well, part of that's true. You know, you're saved and prepared to go to heaven if you really are saved. And I just throw in an extra freebie there. When I was uh, uh, 21 and a preacher starting out, I went through a crisis when I doubted whether I was even saved at the age of 11 because my conversion was so non-dramatic. Have you ever been down to a pond and a turtle slips off a log into the water, there's a little ripple and it's gone? Well, that's kind of how my conversion was. But anyway, back to when I was 11, I was saved, and, and I, I was. they tried to assure me by saying, you're saved and go to heaven, but nobody ever bothered to tell me what being a disciple is. And nobody ever bothered telling me that you're saved to serve. You're saved to follow Jesus. And so there was a void in there in my life for many years. And, and when I went to seminary in New Orleans in, in, at the age of 21, went to my first church, and for the first time I came to understand what being a disciple is. I was, I was introduced to a, a material called Master Life. Have any of y'all ever been through that? Well, a man by a Southern Baptist missionary by the name of Avery Willis uh, wrote Master Life, and uh, he was a missionary over in Southeast Asia in Indonesia. And listen to this, folks. They had a revival where two million people were saved. Y'all had that lately at Occupy, too? Well, I haven't seen that either, but two million people. And so he goes, What now? What do we do with all these new believers? And more than that, you can't put a church together of two million people. So how do we disciple these people? And so Avery Willis put together a discipleship course that's basically four uh, courses kind of in one uh, going from A, B, C, D in being a disciple of Jesus Christ. One of the key verses in that is John 15, 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. So anyway, my, my lack of discipling as a child at the age of 11, being introduced to master life and what it really means to be a disciple of Jesus. And then when I moved here four years ago, God put me on a pilgrimage that brings me tonight to you. A couple of years ago, I was going back and looking at my old sermons. I have about 1,500 sermons in my files that I preached over the years, preaching through books and stuff like that. And I, I looked at Matthew 28, 11. Caleb, y'all can go ahead and put that very first picture up there. I looked at this scripture on my thing. Can, y'all, can you see that, ma'am, over here? Am I cutting you off the scripture? Okay. Okay. 
Anyway, I looked at my sermons and saw how many times I preached on this where it says, Go therefore and make disciples. I preached 11 sermons on that text in different angles. You know, you, you never get all the juice out of the Bible. You can go from different angles. So I preached 11 sermons on that scripture. And you know what all 11 of them were about? Partially. They were basically on going to evangelize. But look at that verse again with me tonight. Go therefore and what? He didn't say go and evangelize. He said go and make disciples. Now, evangelism is the first step in being a disciple. Now, friends, when you came to know Jesus Christ and maybe you were dunked in the baptismal pool, that's just the first step. But many of us never get beyond that, and many churches never get beyond that. And so we ask people, how's your church doing? We baptized 30 last year. But the big question is, how many of those people did you make into disciples? So you see where we're going with this? And folks, we have, many times in the church, we have a a one-legged horse. We've got the leg of evangelism down, and we talk about conversions. But I'll tell you what, folks, why so many people who are members of churches, you know, there's 16 million plus Southern Baptists. Eight million of those, we don't even know where they're at. I even wonder if Jesus could find them. Y'all know that's true right here. I don't know what your membership is, but probably half of you don't know where they're at and don't know who they are. And that's no reflection. That's just churches are that way. So let's get into this material. Look at the first slide there. This first slide... Uh, that Caleb's going to put up. Go ahead and click it, Caleb. Kind of grew out of the journey I was on. Now, if you want to, I'll give you time to write these things down and say that with me. Discipleship is not intended to replace or compete with evangelism, but to what? Enhance it. As we disciple people, we multiply our effectiveness The goal of discipleship is multiplying disciples. Now, write that down. Let it sink in for just a second. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about that and go on further. Discipleship is not intended to replace or compete with evangelism. So you see, when I preach my, my 11 messages on this passage of Scripture, Matthew 28 and 19, I was basically saying evangelism is the whole ball of wax but that's not what the bible teaches evangel discipleship is not intended to replace and i replaced it i'm here at the altar tonight to repent in front of you i replaced discipleship with evangelism but discipleship is not intended to replace or compete you know we say what is your church stronger in evangelism or discipleship they're not supposed to compete with each other but to enhance it in other words if we make disciples We strengthen evangelism. Amen or on me? As we disciple people, we multiply our effectiveness. Go ahead to the next slide, Caleb. I think everybody will have it. Multiplication is more effective than addition. Okay, Brother Mike, I need a guinea pig. If you would, come up here and help me. And That's your side of the church. I'll get over here on my side of the church. All right. Now, I want you to pretend with me for just a second. Mike and I are each one going to start a church, okay? His church is the Mike number one church. Mine is the Tim number one church. Now, let's suppose that he starts his church and he has 50 people in it and I have one. Now, which one is seemingly the most successful? His is. Now, his church, basically, all he does is throw information at them. He doesn't have a plan for to disciple them. He doesn't invest in them. He just basically preaches at them on Sunday, and that's it. However, my one person, I take that one person, and I start investing in them. I carry them visiting with me. I carry them to the hospital with me. I teach them how to share their faith. I teach them how to study their Bible. Now, at the end of one year, he's got 51. I've got two. However... At the end of the second year, he's done the same thing. He's added 50 more. At the end of two years, he's got uh, 101 people. Over here, I take my one and I say, okay, I've taught you how to be a disciple. You go get somebody else and bring him. I want you to invest in him for a year. At the end of two years, how many is in my church? 
four. He's got one, I've got one, so two plus two always makes four. Isn't that right? Okay, got the screw to you. Okay, thank you, Mike. Now, look at this. Go ahead and put the next slide up, Caleb. At the end of 20 years, if that went like it was, Mike would have 901 members in his church. Look at my church over here, though. Say it for me. 76. Now, if, you, if that was money, which would you rather have, the 1 million or the 901? Now, folks, here's a mistake we sometimes make in the church. We make the pastor the head horse. But what happens when we make the pastor the head horse, we have a one-horse church. Now, what would happen if all of us understood that all of us are supposed to be multiplying disciples? See where the church would go? Do, do y'all agree with that? And y'all see that? Now, here's something that sometimes happened. Y- y'all know that when Jesus started the church, there was not Baptists and Methodists. I hate to tell you that. There were no, no Baptists. He just had the church. Well, over a period of time, that church was forming in the Roman Empire. There was still one church in the Roman Empire, and it became known as the Roman Catholic Church. If you ever look the word Catholic up in the dictionary, it means universal church. So originally, there was only one church. And so that church, though, got to where they were controlling. They said, All these Christians are a bunch of dummies. They don't know how to read the Bible for themselves. So that's why the Catholic leaders, the priests, taught in Latin. Because the average person couldn't speak Latin. So it was like, here's the lower class out here, and here's the big cheese up here. And in the 16th century, we had a thing called the Protestant Reformation took place whereby there was believers all over the world as they knew it then. They said, hey, we figured this thing out. We don't have to have a pope to confess our sins to. We don't have to have a a pope to teach us the Bible. And so the church began to multiply instead of having a one-horse show. You follow? I'm giving you a history lesson you didn't bargain for. But the point is... We as Baptists, one of the basic main doctrines we have as a church is called the priesthood of all believers. That means we believe that everybody in the church can read the Bible for themselves. They can pray for themselves. So you say, well, what do we need this guy for? He's equipped and gifted as a pastor. That doesn't mean he's any more special than you are. He puts his pants on just like you do and I do. But you see, the mistake that we make sometimes in the church is we put one man up on a pedestal instead of us under. And I will guarantee y'all that a lot of people who are members of Occupy Two Baptist Church don't understand that God wants them to be multiplying disciples, to be uh, witnesses, to be evangelists, to be ministering out in the community. And so then when that takes place, the pastor's teaching and the pastor's leadership becomes even that much more vital because he's equipping all of us to do what he is doing. Now, Caleb, put the next slide up there, please. Now, uh, this, this struck me a while back. The greatest investment outside of the cross was Jesus' investment in who? Twelve disciples. Have you ever thought about how far Jesus traveled when he was here on earth? How many countries did he go to? He went to one small state called Palestine, which is about 70 to 100 miles long. He never went anywhere. Now, he did when he was in his his, uh, godly state. He went everywhere. But... He never went physically anywhere but Palestine. But he told his disciples, Matthew 28, 19, I want you to go into all the what? Well, he, he called those guys. I know Judas betrayed him, but then they replaced him with another one. But those 12 disciples went all over the then known world. They went to Spain. They went to Italy. They went to North Africa until old Magellan, I mean, uh, Christopher Columbus came along and he came over the 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 waters over here but you see 
The greatest investment Jesus made was in 12 men. Now, is the greatest investment that you and I as church members make in growing numbers? If I can help one person to be a multiplying disciple of Jesus Christ, that is by far the greatest thing I do. Now, Caleb, put the next slide up, please. Now, this thing here, I want, you to, I want to show you how a disciple grows. And when you look at this thing, it might intimidate you, but it's not intended to, all right? And uh, if you will follow this line down here, and I think I... Is there a word over there on the side of your thing called leader? Okay. If I, as a leader, this is what I'm supposed to do to help people come to faith and grow in Christ. First, I witness to somebody. Then I help them to get established in the faith. Then I train them. Then I equip them. Then I commission them. Now, notice over here, the 10 means all the responsibility is on me. You can't expect a lost person to be saved unless you help them. Over here, though, if he's grown where he's supposed to be at, he has taken the great commission of Christ and all the responsibilities on who? Okay, now, this line up here represents people who are coming to disciple and be followers of Jesus Christ. First, they are supposed to respond. Then they're supposed to develop. Then they're supposed to mature. Then they're supposed to reproduce. What are they supposed to do then? You see... When we train people right, everybody in our church understands that they are supposed to do everything that this man right here is supposed to do. Don't let me shine that in your eye. I might blind you. But you see, that's how a believer develops. This is what we do to help him. This is what a, a believer should be responsible for. So all of us tonight should be asking ourselves, Lord, am I a multiplying disciple? Now, this little wavy thing here, that's not a lady's hairdo. Uh, this shows kind of how people develop. You go from being spiritually dead to being a spiritual child. How many of you who have children, did your child know not to touch a heater when they were little? They would touch it and burn themselves up because they didn't know any better. So people develop like that. They, they go from being in the womb to being a child to being a disciple to being a disciple maker, to being a co-laborer in ministry. Hey, guess where I got this from? Master life. You see why that had such a profound effect on my life? Because it helped me understand concepts I had never before put together. But friends, look at this chart very carefully. The goal of, of our church, of my life, is to help people multiply themselves. This is a huge, huge, huge shift from where most of us are at in our lives in terms of helping people. As a young preacher boy, I thought that all I was supposed to do was get up and preach a sermon three times a week or whatever, teach Sunday school lessons. But, you know, a lot of times our teaching people is kind of like throwing seeds and hoping it all comes together. Now, ladies, when y'all cook a cake, do you just kind of take those ingredients and throw them toward the, the cake plate and, and kind of go, I hope it makes a good cake, or do you put them in, you know, in the proper order, you stir them, you cook them, you cook it for so long, and then you got a cake. But you see, many times we don't have people to see that there's an order to this system, and the order brings about multiplying disciples. Now, let me stop for just a second before we go to the next point. And uh, anybody got a question about this? Y'all would stand up for just a second. I don't want you to get tired and bored on me, even though I'm a great speaker and all that stuff. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Okay. All right. You got your legs circulating again. Except for Leslie, she can stand up. She was late getting up. <laughs> okay, turn to page two. You know, you don't, you don't realize that how that the history of Christianity even flows with this stuff. 
and like the thing, and, and I'm not here to slam Catholics because I got great friends that are Catholics in faith, but that, that's just the doctrine of the Catholic Church that they have a pope and then they have the local priest and they put a lot of stock in, in those people. And, uh, but, you know, that kind of separates us. That don't mean that we're better than they are. It's just we believe in the priesthood of all believers. That means all of us are equal. All of us are on the same level. All of us can share Christ and serve Christ, and that's what we ought to be doing. There's no levels. In fact, let me throw a little tidbit out to you. Do y'all know that the first English translation of the Bible, the King James Version, occurred in 1611? Six, almost 1,600 years after Jesus died. Have you ever thought about where was the Bible's at for 1,600 years? Y'all ever thought about that? The priests were hiding them. So finally, in, in, right just before 1611, the king of England, you know what his name was? King James said, I believe that every man, woman, boy, and girl ought to be allowed to have their own Bible. And he gave permission. And listen to this. He was not even a believer. God even uses unbelievers sometimes. Now, here's the rest of the story. There was a guy by the name of William Tyndale who was one of the first people who really helped to translate the Scriptures from uh, Hebrew and Greek and Latin into the English language. You know what they did with him? They burned him at the stake and said he was a heretic for translating the Bible into English. Now, friends, let me just throw a freebie in here to you. If you ever criticize somebody for what translation of Bible they're using, you're doing the same thing that the people in England did to William Tyndale. You're burning them at the stake. For 1,600 years after Jesus, we had no English Bible. Then all of a sudden, we get a few on the landscape, and, and people think that they boss or something. Okay? Now, page two. Discipleship should be at the center of all we do. Okay? Um, brotherhood or Baptist men's groups. What should be the purpose of those? Make disciples. You know, the ladies had this big shindig up in Derrida Friday night. And wonderful, and a lot of y'all came up there. What should be the purpose of a women's conference? To make disciples. And, and sometimes we forget that. And, and, you know, the purpose of a sermon is to make disciples. The purpose of Sunday school is to make disciples. And, and folks, let me put a little plug in here. Sometimes we forget what we do things for. I was doing a seminar for one of our churches on discipleship, I mean, on Sunday school a while back, and I said, y'all tell me something. What is the purpose of Sunday school? Now, this is about 15 or 20 adults sitting in a room. They came up with two answers for why we have Sunday school. What, what would you say they said? Fellowship, you know, eat donuts, drink coffee. I like that, too. But number two was to study the Bible. And I said, folks, could I, could I suggest something to you that will absolutely set you on fire for Sunday school? Didn't Jesus say, go and make disciples? Sunday school ought to be making disciples. Now, I'm chasing some rabbits here, but this is good stuff. I've got to get them in. Now, have you ever thought about all the things that, that are modeled in a Sunday school class on Sunday morning? Now, unfortunately, sometimes things that ought to not be modeled are modeled. I think old Obama ought to be shot. I think Les Miles ought to be fired. I don't like the new judge. Now, folks, that stuff, you know, if you want to talk it, talk it somewhere else. But the house of God ought to be here to study the Word of God. And so when we are having Sunday school, what should we be focusing on? But think about all the things that are modeled in a Sunday school class. 
first off, people walk in, they all see people having a good time in fellowship, eating donuts, drinking coffee. What do we call that? Fellowship. And then we sit down and get ready to start the lesson. They ought to hear real concern about prayer. Not just for people who are, who are sick, but people who need to go to heaven, need to be saved. And then in a lot of Sunday school classes, we pass a little basket around, you know, uh, like these offering plates over here. Now, what is that modeling? We believe that you should tithe and, and be a steward of what you own to God. And then we, we talk about, you know, Joe and Mary had a little baby last week, and, you know, it's hard when you've got a new baby to cook meals, so we say we ought to cook a meal. Okay, so they've seen fellowship. They've seen prayer. They've seen uh, ministry. They've seen Bible study. When maybe the Lottie Moon Christmas offering has come up where we take up money for mission, they see what it means to be a steward. So that's five things right there in that class. And then they say, right before they dismiss, they say, Brother Mike's going to preach a good sermon today. Let's pray for him. They're getting ready for worship. Folks, that is a pretty good place to disciple people if we take that to heart. And so, teachers, please remember, your purpose in teaching a Sunday school is to disciple people. Now, uh, I'm going to insert a couple of books in here and, and something it said. There's a guy who works for the Lifeway of the Southern Baptist Convention, which is our printing board, uh, put a book out some time ago when he it said there's five broken views of discipleship, and I measure what somebody says by what Jesus said. Now, look at what he had to say. Number one, one broken view on discipleship is we create discipleship with information transfer. Now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure that one out, but just because somebody comes to Sunday school and comes to worship and then maybe comes to a discipleship class that afternoon, comes back that night, comes on Wednesday night, does that mean that they're really a disciple of Jesus Christ? Y'all know as well as I do, some of the meanest people on earth are people who have a whole bunch of knowledge up here, but it somehow hadn't gotten down here. So we equate discipleship with what? Now, Brother Mike knows this, but he knows it just because he gets information out does not mean it's going to sink in down here. Number two, we try to program discipleship. Now, uh, Brother LeVon and, and some of the men and Mike and, uh, did you get to come to that class we were having? Okay, uh, I don't know who all, but anyway, a bunch of the men came to a class I taught up at the associational office a while back. And one of the things we talk about is how times change. Now, you know, in the Southern Baptist Convention, we have a thing called discipleship training. And it meets what time here? 5.30? 5? Okay. But to be honest with you folks, there is not one out of a hundred churches in the Southern Baptist Convention that are accomplishing anything with that. Now, I'm, I'm not critic. I'm just saying that's just the facts. In fact, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but if I was a betting man and I wanted to make some money, I would bet that probably maybe 10% of the people in this room would come to a discipleship class. But discipleship is not a class, and it's not a program. I know just in my lifetime, the, the, in the Southern Baptist Convention, we've had, we've called it uh, BYPU. Okay. Many years ago. And I'm not as old as y'all. I mean, I didn't even go there. I didn't say that. But BYPU, then we called it church training. We thought putting a new title on it, got away. And then we called it discipleship training. Train you. That's, I forgot about that one. And so, but, but the point is, folks, a program, a class is not discipleship. Now, it offers good stuff. Now, I'll get to in a minute. If, if they're not going to come to a class, what are we going to do with them? Give them a spanking? Well, number three, we equate discipleship with preaching. Boy, that breaks my heart, Mike. We think we will grow without effort. Now, that don't jive quite as much, but, you know, uh, some people think, there's a lot of people think that if you just come and sit and soak, it's just going to kind of, through what's that word, osmosis? It's just going to kind of sift into your body. I wish I could just walk into the shower and 
click that dial and say, give me a good dose of discipleship. The Lord said, he's so cute when he's dumb. And then last, we don't offer practical steps. Now, I'll get to that a little bit later. So, has everybody got all those wrote down? Okay, Caleb. Now, this is really, uh, uh, is any other school teachers in here? Okay, got a school teacher there, Melissa? Okay. This learning pyramid was developed by a group called the National Training Laboratories in Bethel, Maine. And they studied how people learn best. Now, look at this. What I'm doing right now, y'all going to probably forget what I said by the time you go to bed tonight. That's depressing. Now, let's go down. Reading, they lecture and reading, they retain 10%. Audio-visual, they gain 20%. Demonstration, they gain 30%. Discussion group, 50%. Oh, and let me throw in something here about Sunday school. Teachers, you don't have to get up and show how smart you are when you teach a Sunday school class. Involve the class, and they're going to remember 50% more, or no, 45% more than if you just try to lecture to them. Uh, this morning, my wife was out with the flu, and so I taught the young couples. We had one, two, three, four couples in this class, and all these are below 35 years old. So I went and put my profound lesson on them. I said, okay, now, let me, let me talk to you all about something. Every one of you all in this room, I've got a goal of leading you and working with you, me and Judy, to be church leaders. And I said, I want you all to critique my lesson today. And they said, okay. I said, now what did I do in this lesson today? Well, one young lady who writes for the Beauregard Daily News and is a reporter, she said, you ask a lot of questions. I said, when I ask questions, what am I doing? She said, you're getting us involved. Ding, 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 ding. Then I asked them to do some reading and, you know, to get involved in the class. And then I asked them to learn by doing by giving answers to the questions. And then I brought into the lesson today. Do any of y'all have Explore the Bible in your Sunday school class? Okay, you got it. Well, today we were talking about what is God. Uh, he's sovereign. He's just. He's good. But he's also jealous. And I said, if y'all thought about if y'all heard who Isis is? Or, yeah, everybody knows who Isis is. And I said, Isis is cutting people's heads off and burning them because they have a poor perspective of who God is. Do y'all know there's not a word for God is love in the Muslim faith? So what I did, we went to today's newspaper and pulled something out of the newspaper, and I said, folks, your worldview is vitally important. And what you believe about God is vitally important. Now, look at this last one. Teaching one-to-one. What does that bottom thing say there? 90%. Does that remind y'all of anybody? Who does it remind you of? Jesus Christ. How many disciples did he have? How many was in his inner circle that went with him everywhere he went? Three. Three. And probably he even picked one of those, Simon Peter, out to be the number one. Now, I I don't bet, y'all. I don't go to the casinos. But if you were a betting person and you had to bet on a 90% chance of winning big and a 5%, which would you take? Duh. Even from Converse, you can figure that one out. Now, folks... These things I'm sharing with you ought to sink deep within our hearts. Say, God, this, folks, I'm telling you, it's not because of me. This is what Jesus taught us. What I'm teaching you tonight will absolutely revol- revolutionize your Christian life and the way you see your church and the way you see people. And so uh, principle number two there is discipleship should be at the center of all we do. Let me share one other thing, and this is what God is blessing in evangelical churches across America today. Go ahead and put the next slide up, Caleb. There's a man by the name of Jim Putman. A few years, about 15 years ago, he was 
asked to go to Post Falls, Idaho. Does anybody know where Post Falls, Idaho is at? I've been asking this question. In the, I've done this seminar three times, and one person out of six churches knows where Post Falls, Idaho is at. That tells you what a big town is. But Jim Putman went to Post Falls, Idaho, and he met with four couples 15 years ago, and they said, we want to start a church that does things right. We want to focus on uh, worship and making disciples. Do you know how many of those eight people have today in Post Falls, Idaho, in their worship services on a weekend now? 8,000. That's pretty good, isn't it? You know what their church slogan is? Y'all don't be reading. I'm writing while I'm talking, okay? Wait just a minute. Y'all trying to get ahead of me. You know what their church slogan is? Equipping disciples who make disciples y'all might want to write that down that's not in your notes if i'm equipping disciples who make disciples remember the little church analogy that means my church may look like it's growing slow but it's actually getting ready to explode because i'm teaching people to be co-laborers with me multiplying disciples and doing what I do. Now, Jim Putman wrote a book. Of, and folks, this is what's happening in evangelical churches in America today that God is blessing. One, they're, they're changing their mindset from reaching to making. Instead of saying, how many is your church running now? That's reaching. But churches in evangelical life today in America that God is really using... They're focusing on making disciples. We baptized 50 last year. The big question is not how many you baptized, how many did you disciple? Amen? Number two, from informing to equipping. So if I'm teaching a Sunday school class, i got to hurry. I'm ready for the desserts. I'm getting, I'm getting weak up here. Whoa. Okay, from, from informing to equipping. So if I'm a Sunday school teacher then I want to do more than just to convey a lesson. I want to equip my class in how to pray. I want to teach them to support the pastor. I tell you, folks, when I was pastoring, I had people that wouldn't even come to the worship services because they didn't like me. If, If the Sunday school teachers don't support the worship service, then how do you expect anybody else to? But you see, as a teacher, I'm conveying my convictions about prayer, my convictions about fellowship, my convictions about the Bible, my convictions about my church, my convictions about my pastor. But you see, all that should be taught in a Sunday school class from program to purpose. In other words, it doesn't matter if you have discipleship training or not. It's the, it's the thing is, are you getting the information to the people where they're at? If they won't come to a class, figure out another way to do it. Uh, I know a lot of churches that say they, they realize they can't get people to come at 5 or 5.30 on Sunday afternoon, so they have their discipleship classes on Sunday night. A lot of churches are, uh, instead of having a Sunday night service, they're having discipleship groups. Now, the thing is, folks, if it's not in the Bible, don't get your, your, your heart in a leap. But the thing is, are, are we getting out of the program mentality to say our purpose is to disciple people? Number four, from activity to relationship. Again, I go back. If, if a person in this church goes to every activity you have, does that mean they're any more spiritual than anybody else? I use this illustration sometimes. Suppose on Sunday morning, I've preached here for your church, and after church, I want to go out and turn into a car. So I lay down out there in the middle of that road. Does that make me a car? I did the activity. All you said was, that guy's nuts. You see, activity does not equate to a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now listen, 
If we love Jesus Christ, should we not be willing to go anywhere and do anything that he wants us to do? Y'all know I've got a son who's a missionary over in China, and they've been there 10 years, and uh, I may have told y'all this, and, and if, I, if I did, y'all say, he's just getting old, and he's senile, and he can't remember what he told. But we carried our son and our daughter-in-law to the airport up in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. I was pastoring in Tuscaloosa. Oh, forgive me for that, Lord. And uh, we carried them there out to the airport. Boy, I was dreading that for weeks and weeks and weeks. I said, oh, this is going to be tough. And I said, I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to cry. I got to the airport. What do y'all think I did? I didn't just cry. I wailed. I went, ah! I mean, I was, people were looking at me. What's wrong with that man over there? Somebody die? Well, I was giving my son away to the Chinese for a lifetime. I've watched my kids grow up on Skype. I see them from time to time. But I tell you what, friends, and I don't claim to be some super saint. I'm just a sinner down here on the, on the scum row. But if I didn't love Jesus Christ just a little bit, I can tell you I wouldn't have put my son on that airplane. I'd have got him a job out at Boise or something. And I tell you what, dear friend, if you don't love Jesus Christ and have a love relationship with him, you may come and sit on the pew every Sunday. Is it okay if I preach a little bit, Brother Mike? Okay. If you don't have a love relationship with Jesus Christ, you'll be, as they say up at Converse, dead as a door hammer. Do you know why a lot of people don't have any passion spiritually? And when, when I get to where I don't have any passion, I say, Lord, what's wrong with me? With who? With Jesus. Number five, from accumulating to deploying. So instead of us saying, well, we had 75 in church today, a better gauge is how many missionaries did we send out? Now, Sunday school teachers, I'm not down on y'all. I'm, I'm picking on y'all a little bit tonight. But if I got a Sunday school class and there's 20 people in my class this year, and next year, there's still 20 people in my class. What should I be asking myself? There's something wrong with my teaching. How many children's workers have I sent out this year? How many mission projects have our class done this year? Amen or oh me? How many people have we sent to the youth ministry to help with the youth ministry? And, and we got this little thing... This is our class. Keep your hands off of it and don't bother any of our people. If I'm a real man of God, if I'm a real teacher, then my goal is to deploy people out of my class into other classes. And you know, sometimes we need to create new units, new classes in churches. And we say, you know, that class over there, they got so many they can't even close the door. They're all getting fat from eating donuts. But yet, you ask that class, hey, why don't y'all give birth and start a new class? You ain't tearing our class up. We'll cut your throat before you do that. What are we trying to do? Accumulate. What does Jesus want us to do? Now, that's a pretty good book that guy wrote. But he's seeing it happen in his church. Now, one other thing, and we're going to go eat some donuts. Turn to page three. And I told Brother Mike this was going to last about an hour. Y'all please stand up one more time. We, we, this, we, this is three points, and I don't have a poem, so one of y'all will have to write it. If you need to stretch or something, I don't want you to go to sleep on me. Okay, now, have a seat, and let's look at point number three. Discipleship is a process. Now, you school teachers... Do, do kids just show up in kindergarten and jump from kindergarten to the 12th grade? She looked at me like, are you crazy? Now, with kids, we first teach them how to, you know, do the ABCs and read and write. Then they go to the elementary school, and they're learning all kind of neat stuff. Then they go to junior high school, and they go crazy at that point. And then they go through high school, and we teach them, you know, math and algebra and things like that. But you see, education and learning is kind of like building blocks. 
Judy and I just built a new house out on the other side of DeRitter. And you know when you're building a house, you get so excited and you're pumped up about it and you want to see it there. And so we buy this three and a half acres of land. Boy, it's covered with trees. And I'm thinking, good Lord, I'm going to put a house there. And water's about a foot deep right where we want to put our house. But we start the process. So we start cutting trees and bulldozing and cleaning up. And then they put the, the clean up and put the pad down where the house is going to sit. Then they bell framed and, and, and pour the concrete. And then they put up the walls and they put on the roof. And you know how you build a house. Well, that's a process. But you see, when people come to be saved and come into our church, we say, oh, by the way, you're going to heaven. Have we missed something? It's a process. Now, go ahead, Caleb. Here a while back, I was studying from the book of Matthew. You can do this in all of the Gospels, but I used Matthew just so that there would be continuity. And so I looked at how Jesus de developed his disciples. In Matthew 4.19, it says, Follow me, and I will what? Make you fishers of men. That was the call to be a disciple. Then in Matthew 5, 7, 5, 6, and 7, we call that what? Sermon on the Mount. Okay. In, that, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus does what's called the Beatitudes. He talks about prayer. He talks about lust. He talks about divorce. He talks about murder. He talks about forgiveness. And so he called them. Then he did what to them? He taught them. Then, boy, this blew me away. In Matthew 8 and 9, Jesus modeled. And if you go and read those two chapters, you go home and I don't do it now, I'm talking. You'll find that in those chapters, Jesus dealt with a bunch of, of people that needed ministry. He, he heals one or two lepers. He casts demons out of a couple people. Boy, don't that sound like a Tuesday night visitation. He, uh, he healed several people and he ministered. But the thing is, he did it, but what was he doing? What's that word right there? He was modeling. Okay, church leaders. When people look at me, when they look at Brother Mike and Leslie, now they're not just looking to get the latest view. They ought to be seeing me as a model. Now, can I meddle some more? If you're a Christian, and people look at your life, they ought to see you modeling. Last week, you know, a lot of the work I do is with pastors, praying with them, encouraging them. We got a round table, Mike and I are in every Wednesday where we are doing a leadership thing. And last week, a, a, a lady from another church said, we got something going on in our church. I said, well, what you doing about it? She said, well, the deacons have been meeting to talk about it. But she said, the thing that makes the problem worse is most of our deacons don't even come to church except on Sunday morning. I didn't say that. She told me that. And I said, so let me, let me make sure I'm listening to this right. Are you saying that you have trouble following men who are not setting a good example? She said, that's exactly what I'm saying. Now, let's take a vote on this. How many of y'all think that church leaders, whether it's pastors, Sunday school teachers, deacons, ought to be a good model for people to follow? We're kind of shy on that, aren't we? But if we're going to lead people, we can't lead people where we've never been. Gotten quiet in here, hasn't it? He called them. He taught them. He modeled. What did he do in Matthew 10, 5? He put them in pairs, two by two, and sent them out. And then Matthew 11, and you know, Matthew 11 goes to the end of the chapter, and then it jumps over to Acts 1 after Jesus has died, and he's about to go back to heaven. And so... He spends his time there aligning them with his teachings. They hadn't got the lesson yet. You know what, what that encouraged me about? Even though I may be a disciple that don't have it all together, the Lord's still working on me. And here's an example. 
in Acts chapter 1, Jesus was he about ready to put on his wings and go back to heaven. And his disciples, after they had turned their backs on him before the resurrection, after he had rose from the grave, they come up to him and said, Hey, Lord, when are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, this is not in the Bible, but I, I think I got this one right. Jesus stood there, and he must have folded his arms up and did like this. He was what? And what did he say to them after they asked that dumb question? I did not come to establish a kingdom for Israel. I came to establish a kingdom for God. Folks, your job as Occupy 2 Baptist Church is not to build a bigger church. Your job and my job is to build a kingdom for God and establish it for Him. Now, that's what we mean by a process. Okay? Caleb, put this next up. I'm just about through. I invented a new word, I mean, in, re in relationship to, to discipleship. It's the word rip. It, it fits, so that's the best thing I could do. First, and this tells how Jesus' process, his process was relational. What did he say in Matthew 4, 19? I'm giving you a hint here. Follow me. So, in other words, you're not going to do anything you ought to do if you, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. So, when I'm trying to translate that out into my life, I'm, I'm constantly trying to build relationship. We go to New Life Church in DeRitter, and uh, last Sunday, this little couple, they, I don't know, I don't even think they're 30 years old, came, they're a prospect for our Sunday school class, so they came and sat down by us because we had been to visit them. And so we were sitting there watching, uh, listening to the sermon and worshiping all together, and my, my wife leaned over, and, and I don't always listen as good as I should, but she said, Tim, don't you think it would be a good thing if we carried the, this couple out to uh, lunch? In fact, he works out at Boys. He talked about it, I, I introduced you. And, uh, he, she, I, and what's amazing about that, right before she said that, the Lord just kind of spoke to me. He said, Tim, uh, why don't y'all carry that couple out to lunch? Now, I'm a tightwad. If you've asked me to, to, to separate from a dollar, I don't want to do it. My wife, she's just got a big heart. So, I, so we said, that's the thing to do. Now, we were trying to build relationships between us and them, not for Jesus. In fact, yesterday afternoon, I carried that man. He, he was talking about he liked to burn a little fire just kind of cozy and, you know, to help with the power bill and stuff. So I, I, I got a big wheelbarrow load of wood and carried it over to his house and, and put it there by his door. Now you say, what are you trying to do there? Build a relationship. Secondly, Jesus' process was intentional. Now, you see, when I saw that, that little couple sitting by us in church, I was thinking, Jesus sure would love to have a hold of them. Now, last year when I was out here, I, I, I shared with y'all the book I wrote, Care Fronting People to Christ. In fact, I got some of those, put a little commercial in there. But in that book, I tell about a man named Robert. And uh, this is a story I know I told this one to y'all, but it's, it's a good story. Uh, we moved into a, a home down in Florida at a church I was pastoring, and Robert was our next-door neighbor. So the day we moved in, he, he knows I'm a preacher, but in, anyway, he comes over and he meets me, and he says, I hear you're a preacher at the Baptist Church. I said, yeah, Robert. And, and so the deacon, who's a rare, wonderful man of God, he was introducing us and all. And Robert said, preacher, you see that fence there? He said, that fence separates your land from my land. And he said, let's do a favor. You stay on your side of the fence, and I'll stay on mine. Now, isn't that the way you like a neighbor to greet you? He said, stay away from me. Now, what I did is I started with a relationship, and then I was intentional. I didn't say a word to him about church. I didn't say a word to him about God. I said, God, this guy's going to be a hard nut to crack. So I'd call him and say, hey, Robert, I know a guy that's got a tree fell down in his yard. He'll give us the wood. You want to go help me? Let's cut it down. So he said, 
Yeah, I reckon. And, and one day we were out there cutting wood, and, and Robert's cousin came by, and he said, uh, hey, Robert, you know who that fellow is you're working with? And he said, yeah, he's a Baptist preacher. Now listen to this. Robert said to that man, I think he's trying to get me in his church. Now, I didn't tell him my plan, me and God, but I was slowly and intensely loving on him and influencing him, Jesus through me. First relationship, secondly intentional. This comes out of Matthew 4, 19. Follow me. There's a relationship I will make. Oh, let me share one other thing with you here that will bring this to light. In Acts 1 and 2, Jesus established his church. Anybody have a problem with that? Well, I know that because in Acts 2, 47 is the first time the word church appears in the Bible. Now, it appeared one other time in Matthew 16 when Jesus was prophetically talking about the coming church, but that's the first time it, appeared, it shows up in the Bible, Acts 2, 47. So in Acts 1, Jesus is getting ready to sprout wings and go back to heaven. And he's getting ready to launch his church. Listen to this. He doesn't have a pastor. He doesn't have deacons. He doesn't have a building. He doesn't have a church van. He don't have a DOM. And he's fixing to start a church with all that in absence. And the only candidates to be the leaders in his church, listen to this, don't think the Lord doesn't have a sense of humor. The only candidates he has to start his new church with was 12 men and what had they just done? They deserted him at his most critical hour. Now, let that sink in. Jesus starts his church. No pastor, no deacons, no buildings, no van, no padded pews, no outhouse. With the aid of the Holy Spirit, what did Jesus start his church with? people he invested in 12 ragtag men that didn't even have the guts to stand by him when he hung on the cross but he used those 12 to start his church and then it was beginning to you know develop a crowd around there several hundred more people so folks listen to me listen to me this is powerful if jesus started his church relationally with people investing in people and intensely leading them where he wanted them to be, what our, ought our church ought to be doing? As a church leader, I should be pouring myself into people. Folks, one of the biggest curses that's ever been placed on the church is the church becoming an institution rather than a living organism. As an institution, we're concerned about keeping light bulbs changed and what color to paint the walls and should we buy a church van. And I'm, folks, we need a place to worship, yeah. But we get so caught up in the peripheral that we fail to see the most urgent and important thing that we ought to be doing. Follow me, I will make you and then the last part of his process was focused on productive disciples. Now, we get hung up here. We look at Matthew 4, 19, and what do we say when we, we say, follow me and I will make you what? Fishers of men. Now, by that, we think that everybody ought to be out sharing their faith, and we, they should. But what did he say in Matthew 28, 20? Read that with me. Teaching them to observe all things. If I don't teach a person that to be a follower of Jesus Christ, you've got to be willing to take up your cross and follow him, I've just preached half the gospel. If I don't teach people that you might have to put your son on a plane to China, I've just preached half of the gospel. If I don't teach people that Jesus Christ ought to be first in your life. 
above your husband, your wife, your kids, your deer hunting, your fishing. And that don't mean you throw away all that. I've got a better relationship with my wife because of Jesus Christ than I ever had without him. But you see, if I don't teach people that the Bible says, take up your cross and follow me, I've only preached half of the gospel. The first half is get converted. The second half, what does it say there? Observe all things. I tell you what, folks, could I get irritated a little bit? I get so irritated, and, and I know people need to point a finger at me because I'm not perfect either. But when people want to come and join the church as if it's a social club or something, they can come when they want to, they can tithe when they want to, they can show up when they want to. Folks, Jesus Christ did not teach that. In fact, there were a lot of people who came over and tested the waters with Jesus, and when he started tightening the screws down, they said, I don't want any of that. Read it with me. Observe all things. Was Jesus' life a pleasant life? It was pleasant in the sense that he was in God, but man back there shook his hand. No, it wasn't. I mean, I wouldn't want to go to a cross. But yet the cost of following Christ is big. I, I don't know that I would do this, but one of the things that a lot of churches around America are doing today is that they, before you join the church, you have to go through a membership class to know what you're getting into. It's really good because you're telling them, okay, if you're going to join our church, we want to help you to be a fisherman. We want to help you to learn to observe all things. Amen? Now, let me show you. this. All y'all know Tim Lee, don't you? Pastor at Smyrna. He grew up out here in your community. I was out at Smyrna last Sunday night doing this, this uh, seminar. Go ahead, Caleb, to the next slide. And Tim borrowed something from Andy Stanley, and he's kind of... Uh, souped it up to be for Smyrna. And here's an example of a process. First, when you go visit people, you get on the front porch. You know, you knock on the door. You're a little bit nervous. You know, are they going to shoot me? What's going to happen? But on the front porch is where you start to build relationships. My name is Mike. My name is Tim. That, that helps you to understand that the first process is the front porch. Go ahead, Caleb, the next one. Then they invite you in and you go into the living room. That's where things start getting good. Uh, you want a cup of coffee? Sure do. You want some cake to go with that? Sure do. And you get to talking. Uh, I grew up at Con. Oh, you didn't. I grew up at Oak Grove. That's only three miles down the road. First thing you know, we're kissing cousins. But you see, the front porch is kind of the, the first phase. The second phase is the living room. And it helps people to mentally visualize where you're trying to lead them to. Caleb? Okay? And the last is the kitchen. Now, this is, I'm going to have to straighten Tim out about this, but the kitchen for us men is not maybe the ideal thing, but you get the point. Ministry and mission is serving in God's kitchen. Now, the last few days, I've been doing more in the kitchen because my wife has had the flu, and uh, neither one of us enjoys unloading the dishwasher. Does anybody enjoy unloading? That's the most, most, uh, heart-wrenching job unloading the dishwasher but i've been the last few days i've been trying to be a good husband and so i've been washing dishes loading and unloading the dishwasher and and i, I come in uh, uh friday before this big women's shindig i said how you feeling judy and she said fine i said well you just sit down i'll take care of everything so i changed the covers on the bed and uh, i'm such a good boy but the thing is you see the, the people who go into the kitchen, husband or wife, they're serving the family. So you see, many times in the church, we throw out all these things, but they don't seem to have any correlation to each other. But you go back to Matthew 4, 19. Jesus said, follow me, get a relationship. And, and what did he say next? Just the next phrase. I will make you. That's the living room. That's being intentional. So my vision ought to be 
what can I do to help the person get out of the living room into the kitchen? And that's where they start doing what a disciple ought to be doing. And this is what it means to make disciples. Now, folks, to, to, for me as an individual, and I'm, I'm being honest with y'all folks, some of the things I've taught you tonight, I never did for 34 years. And part of the reason was I was so busy being a pastor that I didn't have time to make disciples as Jesus did it. Relationally, intentionally, and helping them to be productive. Now, Brother Mike, you know this, but folks, all the rest of you, we need to listen to this. People catch what they see in you. Truth is not caught as much as it is, it's not taught as much as it is caught. Discipleship is not taught as much as it is caught. I've been picking on Mike. Deacons, if people in this church don't see you and see something that represents discipleship, how do you expect them to respect you as a leader in this church? That's hard, but it's truthful. But somewhere down the road, years ago, the church missed out. Somewhere between 1611, when the King James came in, where we're at today, somehow the church got so busy doing stuff that we missed what it means to really make disciples like Jesus. He chose 12 relationally. He was intentional in where he led them. But then he told them, he said, I want to make you fishers of men. And if you want to transform your Sunday school class teachers, make your goal to make disciples. If you deacons want to transform the, the deacon ministry of this church, y'all agree that the first thing we're going to talk about at every deacon's meeting is who, who needs to be ministered to, who's absent, who's hurting, what do we need to do to support Brother Mike in trying to reach our community for Christ? And by the way, on the tail end, if you've got any time left, talk about paying bills and keeping the building up. In fact, I would suggest you get you a committee to handle that so you guys can focus on what's really important, and that's ministry. I bet I done made a bunch of enemies here tonight, but I tell you what, you show me where anything I've taught you tonight is wrong, and I'll give you a $100 bill. I'm so confident that this is what Jesus wanted us to do. Brother Mike, anything in closing? We're going to have the blessing, and we're going to go. You took up part of my time, so I didn't go much over an hour, but thank God for worship leaders. We appreciate you, brother. And y'all, y'all let me encourage you. People that do things to feed you, your worship leader, your pastor, your Sunday school teacher, your deacons who serve you, don't forget to say thank you appreciate you and I appreciate what you're doing and the pianist and anybody in the church because all of us want to pat on the back and rather than us having to give it to ourselves we ought to, we ought to give it to other people when you encourage people it will bear fruit for the glory of Christ let's pray together and we'll move to the back father thank you for these sweet people here at Occupy 2 thank you for the pastor and what he's doing to lead them and, Lord, I just pray that you would com- uh, create a community of encouragement and a com- community that wants to see people disciple and grow in Christ. And I pray that you'll bless them as they serve you through this community. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.